Process selection refers to deciding on the way the production of goods and services will be organized. This step is vital as this will have major implications for capacity planning, layout of facilities, equipment, and design of work systems. Process selection occurs as a matter of course when new products or services are being planned. However, it also occurs periodically due to technological changes in products or equipment. There are five basic process types. The first type is a job shop. Job shop usually operates on a small scale production. It is used for outputs with low volume but with high variety. It has an intermittent processing, meaning work includes small jobs, each with somewhat different processing requirements. High flexibility using general purpose equipment and skilled workers are important characteristics of a job shop. Examples of this would be tool and dye shop, a paint shop, a commercial printing shop, and other manufacturers that make custom products in small volume. Next is the batch processing. Batch processing is used when a moderate variety and moderate volume of goods and services is needed. The equipment need not be as flexible as in a job shop, but processing is still intermittent. Because there is less variety in the jobs being processed, the skill level of workers doesn't need to be as high as in a job shop. Examples would be bakeries which make cakes and cookies in batches, and movie theaters which show films to groups or batches of people. Next type is repetitive processing. Repetitive processing, also known as assembly, is used when higher volumes of more standardized goods and services are needed. Standardized output means there is light equipment flexibility. Skill of workers is generally low and it follows the same production sequences. Examples of products made by this type of system include automobiles, pencils, television sets, and computers. An example for a service system is an automatic car wash. The next process type is called a continuous system. Continuous system is used for a very high volume of highly standardized output. It has almost no variety in output, meaning there is no need for equipment flexibility. Worker skill requirements can range from low to high depending on the complexity of the system and the expertise workers need. Generally, if equipment is highly specialized, worker skills can be lower. Examples of products made in continuous system include steel, sugar, flour, and salt. Continuous services include air monitoring and supplying electricity to homes and businesses. The last process step is called project. A project is used for work that is non-routine with a unique set of objectives that needs to be accomplished in a limited time frame. For this step, equipment flexibility and worker skills can range from low to high. Examples range from simple to complicated including such things as putting on a play, consulting, launching a product, publishing a book, and building a bridge. The type of process or processes used by an organization influences a great many activities of the business. This table will help us to further understand how job shop, batch, repetitive, continuous, and project will affect activities such as cost estimation, cost per unit, equipment use, fixed costs, variable costs, labor skills, marketing, scheduling, and working process inventory. The processes discussed do not always exist in their pure forms. It is not unusual to find hybrid processes, or processes that have elements of other process types embedded in them. For instance, companies that operate primarily in a repetitive mode or continuous mode will often have repair shops that have a job shop process to fix or make new parts for equipment that fails. Also, if volume increases for some items, an operation that began, say, in a job shop or as a batch mode may evolve into a batch or repetitive operation. This may result in having some operations in a job shop or batch mode and others in a repetitive mode. Layout refers to the configuration of departments, work centers, and equipment with particular emphasis on movement of work, customers, or materials through the system. Layout decisions are important because of the following reasons. 1. They require substantial investment of money and effort. 2. It is a long-term commitment. and 3. It has significant impact on the cost and efficiency of operations. 
Facility layout has three basic types, product, process, and fixed position. The first type is a product layout. Product layout uses standardized processing operations to achieve smooth, rapid, high volume flow. This kind of layout is the most conducive to repetitive processing. In product layout, the work is divided into a series of standardized tasks, permitting specialization of equipment and division of labor. For instance, if a portion of a manufacturing operation required a sequence of cutting, sanding, and painting, the appropriate pieces of equipment would be arranged in that same sequence. The resulting arrangement forms a line and in manufacturing environment, this line is referred to as the production line or assembly line. Under the service layout, there are four kinds of layout, office layout, retail layout, warehouse and storage layout, and work cell layout. Office layout is a grouping of people, their equipment, and space to provide comfort, safety, and movement of information. Next, retail layout is used to maximize profitability per square foot of floor through allocating shelf space and responding to customer behavior properly. In retailing, manufacturers pay slotting fees to retailers for their products to get a prominent place on the retailer's shelves. A good store layout serves many purposes such as, for instance, smooth customer flow, prevention of shelf lifting, and keeps logistics under control. Next, warehouse and storage layout is used to optimize trade-offs between handling costs and costs associated with warehouse space. Handling costs include all costs associated with the transaction like incoming transport, storage, finding and moving material, outgoing transport, equipment, and people. For the last type of service layout, we have work cell layout. Work cell layout reorganizes people and machines into groups to focus on single products or product groups. The advantages of work cells are 1. Reduce work in process inventory. 2. Less floor space required. 3. Reduce raw material and finished goods. 4. Reduce direct labor. 5. Heightened sense of employee participation. 6. Increase use of equipment and machinery. And 7. Reduce investment in machinery and equipment. In addition, the requirements of work cells are the following. Identification of families of products, a high level of training, flexibility, and empowerment of employees, being self-contained with its own equipment and resources, and lastly, a test at each station in the cell. The second type of layout is called process-oriented layout. Process layout, also known as functional layout, is designed to process items or provide services that involve a variety of processing requirements. The variety of jobs that are processed requires frequent adjustments to equipment. This causes a discontinuous workflow, which is referred to as intermittent processing or non-repetitive processing. A manufacturing example of process layout is the machine shop, which has separate departments for milling, grinding, drilling, and so on. Items that require those operations are frequently moved in lots or batches to departments in a sequence that varies from job to job. The third type of layout is called fixed position layout. Fixed position layout is used when the item being worked on remains stationary and workers, materials, and equipment are moved as needed. Fixed position layouts are widely used in farming, firefighting, road building, home building, remodeling and repair, and drilling for oil. In each case, compelling reasons bring workers, materials, and equipment to the product's location instead of the other way around. The three basic layout types are ideal models, which may be altered to satisfy the needs of a particular situation. It is not hard to find layouts that represent some combination of these spirit types. For instance, supermarket layouts are essentially process layouts. Yet, we find that most use fixed pad material handling devices such as roller type conveyors in the stockroom and belt type conveyors at the cash registers. Hospitals also use a basic process arrangement, although frequently patient care involves more of a fixed position approach in which nurses, doctors, medicine, 
and special equipment are brought to the patient. Today we'll be talking about assembly line balancing. First of all, what is an assembly line? It's a product layout dedicated to combining the components of a good or service that has been created previously. Another description of assembly line is that it is a manufacturing process in which parts are added as the semi-finished assembly is moved from one workstation to another where the parts are added in sequence until the assembly is finished. So specifically, what is this assembly line balancing? It is a technique for grouping tasks to balance the workload on workstations. The objective of this assembly line balancing is to minimize the imbalance between machines or personnel while meeting required output. So assembly line balancing is done when some tasks in the assembly line takes much longer time to accomplish than previous or succeeding tasks in the assembly line. Therefore, some tasks must be grouped together in a workstation in order to not waste time. So here we have an example of a company which produces its products using an assembly line. Retarp Innovations is a company that produces innovative recycled everyday products. The Retarp tent, the company's flagship product, is an innovative tent made from used billboard tarpaulin. The tent sells for 1,499 pesos and there are 480 minutes available during the day for production and the av average daily demand has been 50 tents. The tasks involved in production involves the following. So in this table, we could see the tasks involved in production. Here we have the, the tasks from A to I, the, per, the performance time for each task, and the prerequisite for the said task. So now we want to know how to balance an assembly line. The procedure to balance an assembly line is first to establish the precedence relationship of tasks by developing a precedence diagram. Second, it's to determine the cycle time. The cycle time is the interval between successive outputs. This means that one cycle time is equal to one full assembly or one full product. The formula for getting the cycle time is production time available per day over units required per day. The third procedure is to calculate the theoretical minimum number of workstations. The theoretical minimum number of workstations is the least possible number of workstations or workstations in an assembly line. So a workstation is when you group tasks together. A workstation could include only a single task or could also include multiple tasks depending on the situation. So the formula for solving for the theoretical number of workstations is the summation of task times over the cycle time. The last procedure is to assign tasks to workstations. So now that we know the procedures for balancing an assembly line, let us now balance the assembly line for our given example. So first step, we develop a precedence diagram. So as you could see, this is what a precedence diagram looks like. Here we put the tasks inside the nodes and we place the, ta the task times or the performance times above or below the nodes. Second is we solve for the cycle time. So as we said earlier, the formula for solving the cycle time is production time available per day over units required per day. So for our example, the production time available per day, per day is 480 minutes over units required per day, which is 50 units. So the cycle time for our example is 9.6 minutes per unit. Third procedure is to calculate for the theoretical minimum number of workstations. So again, the formula for solving for the theoretical number of workstations is the summation of task times over the cycle time. So if we add the task times over the cycle time, which is 9.6, we get an answer of 5.104.
or approximately six workstations. The fourth and final procedure is to assign tasks to workstations. So in assigning tasks to workstations, we have to know the theoretical number of workstations. And for our example, that is six. Each workstation in our example must have a total task time of six or less. Tasks which have task times less than six may be grouped together as long as their total do, does not exceed six. For the tasks in our example, tasks A and B as well as tasks H and I may be grouped together because their total does not exceed six. Now after grouping tasks that can be grouped together, we now have seven workstations and our assembly line is now balanced.